We're getting on to. Let's see, yep, let's get it down. First Corinthians ten twenty five. First Corinthians ten. And this is where we get to the part I was talking about where other people, when it comes to types of food and stuff. Okay. First Corinthians ten twenty five. Let me get down here. We're going to start at 12. Oh, we're going to this is going to be a long one. We're going to start at 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. I think that's the number one reason God gave us a conscience. Okay? So we can bear the temptations. And God will not allow us to be tempted to the point that it's not our fault. It's always going to be your fault if you give in to sin. Verse 14, and that's a memory verse of mine. So a verse to have memorized. Wherefore, my delivered, dearly beloved, Flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. The cup of blessings which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? What did we talk about over in 1 Corinthians 8, chapter 8? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idols is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils, and not to God. Okay. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. And this was a big thing for me, and I had to think about it and pray about it. Part of this, when we get through it, it's talking about one person believing this animal is unclean, the other person believes it's okay to eat. And then you, it, we'll get to that part about your conscience. But here, it's saying that Gentiles sacri they sacrifice devils and not to God. And I'm part of me is wondering, you can give me your input in the comments, that this could apply to people who give communion to the Trinity, that you're not to partake in that. And you're not, and they're lost. So yeah, you can't have fellowship with lost people. So I wish, so I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So I answered my question. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Um, you're not to have fellowship with that's why I don't want to argue and debate these people online about the Trinity and people coming on saying, what does communion have to do with it? It has everything to do with it. Okay. I do not want to have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink, and I'm talking about people who are hardcore. Uh, there's nothing wrong with giving communion to the Trinity. The Trinity is the true God when it's a false God. Okay. At that point, you don't talk to them about the Bible. You're not... You just preach the gospel to them, the true Jesus Christ of Scripture, the Godhead. Number 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker of the Lord's table and, and of the table of devils. You need to repent of, the, of following the Trinity and, follow the, and go back to the Godhead and if you're one of those people that actually believe the Trinity way, you need to repent and get saved. Repent and believe. You can't be the partaker of the Lord's table. The Catholics believe they can. The Lord's table and the table of devils. The Catholics believe you can. They worship Satan and claim to worship Jesus at the same time. 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than He? All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. And that's where we're getting into the things where it might be okay for me, but it's not okay for you. And we'll talk about this. Verse 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. 25. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Okay. 
once again, for conscience sake. So you don't get to the point where God's going to chasten you. And we talked over here about idolatry. Uh, right here, verse four, 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. When you idolize people, like all these people, fancy outfits, expensive cars, expensive homes, they're eating the most, in this shambles, they're eating the most delicate of foods. Like today, we eat like kings compared to back then. But a good example for me is I have a budget and I'm not poor. I don't need money from the brethren. I do my donations. I have everything set out, but I'll buy a cheaper brand of food. And someone comes in and buys a more expensive brand. I'm not supposed to sit there and go, man, I wish I could have that more expensive brand. I made homemade uh, vanilla ice cream. Had got an old uh, ice cream making machine from my grandma. And I told my brother, I gave him a list of everything I needed because he was staying over and I was going to make ice cream for Thanksgiving. And he came back and said, I don't know what you got me, but it was so expensive. He got everything that was natural. It was a, it was a healthy but very rich ice cream. And it cost, I think, close to 80 bucks for everything. Because even that little vial of the vanilla bean um, extract, I think it was like $20, $22 because he got the good stuff. And if he'd have bought all the secondary stuff, it probably wouldn't have been as healthy, but he could have gotten away with like 25 bucks. So here it comes to about uh, from idolatry. We're not to idolize people that have more money than us, that can afford the better food, like the rare foods and stuff. Okay, for conscience sake, you don't want idolatry. You don't want God coming in and saying, you, you think they have it better? Bam. Okay. Remember, sometimes God will give you what you want and you'll be like, uh, God was right in telling me I, I didn't need this and I shouldn't want this. 26. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Okay. Um, you can eat with lost people. This and you can eat with conscience sake. But verse 28, but if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols. Now, conscience sake in that first one, I always like to add, when we get to talking about different types of food, it's not talking about fast food, food that is bad for you because of how it's prepared and what they put in it. It has to do with types of food, like with the Jewish people, we'll get to that with pork. Okay. But here, but if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Remember we talked about how your conscience can bear witness? You tell them, I'm sorry, I don't eat food offered to pagan idols. I love my God. I love Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. I don't do that. Okay. You do it for conscience sake. You don't want to fall into the trap that we talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 of falling into your conscience starts getting weak and you start eating food that's offered into idols. Then it gets so weak that it becomes defiled. Okay. And like I said, I don't believe Christians will get to that point. And if you disagree, you can talk to me with scripture in the comment section. But I do believe it will lead to the Holy Spirit convicting you, chastening, and even death. So for conscience sake, you don't eat food offered to idols. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Talking about... God said all animals are clean, just like he was referencing it to the Gentiles, where we're adopted in when we get saved. 29. Conscience, I say not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Mm -hmm. People are always arguing about having a little glass of wine. 
Okay, I have a little glass of wine with dinner. I do a little glass of red wine when I do communion. But there's also people that, I used to be an alcoholic, not me, but I'm using this as an example. I used to be an alcoholic, and I come to a, a Brothers in Christ's house, and they go to do communion. That brother, my conscience is clear. I don't have an alcohol problem. But you have a brother in Christ that does. So a good brother in Christ would say, you know what? He had a problem with alcohol. We're going to use grape juice tonight. I'm going to put the wine away. We're going to do grape juice. I don't do wine, period. But we're going to do grape juice. That's what this is talking about. Um, you decide you have a guy that's trying to lose weight, or a woman, and you invite him over to your house, and you cook this food, and then you bring out this huge cake, and these cookies, and this, and throw it in front of him, and you're sitting there eating in front of him. You don't do that, okay? I'm skinny, I'm in shape, I should be able to do it. Remember what it says over here, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. Okay? You've got to be aware of other people's consciences too, stuff that they're struggling with, so you don't add temptation and put make their conscience weak. Okay. How far are we going to verse 33? Verse 30, For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Why can't I do it? It's, I don't have a problem with it. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to glory of God. He has a problem with it, I'm not going to do it. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Okay. You don't tempt your brothers and sisters in Christ. You don't get into an argument over food. Um, you go to someone's house and a Jew says they only do pork. You don't get in there and go, well, the Bible says, it's getting kind of hot. The Bible says, you know, that everything is clean, and you get into an argument with that. How are you supposed to witness to somebody that you're arguing about something else? He's not going to get it until he gets saved. Okay. Uh, and then when you find out that they're eating food offered to idols, um, I've gone, and I probably shouldn't anymore, but I've gone to Chinese restaurants where they have Buddha there, rub his stomach, and you look around, they've got a lot of pagan symbols. And you could be, and I haven't looked into their, they say culture, but how they do things, you could be eating food offered to idols. Someone wants to go there, you sit there, and you order water and you might not want to eat. I don't know. But you, could, you don't have to eat if you feel that your conscience says, I think this is offered to idols. Then don't eat it. But don't get in a fight with them. Oh, you're wicked, you're eating you can tell about sin saying, I won't do that because I believe it's a sin. There's only one God, Jesus Christ. And the door might open for you to preach to him. Okay. Now, we get to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. So, once again, this keeps saying, for conscience sake, for conscience sake. You don't want... God's chastening on you, and you don't want God's chastening on somebody else. You don't want somebody else's conscience to get weak, that the Holy Spirit has to step in, and then God has to step in and chasten them. Okay. For conscience sake. And 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I don't know why. Sometimes I keep going forward when I need to go back. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 12, but we're going to read 11 and 12. Just making sure I'm correct on this one. Okay. 11. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, 
that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Okay. Uh, I believe that people were giving to Paul, like for food, clothing, uh, giving him lodging. Number 12, or verse 12, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and good sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more bluntly to you were. So here we see that your conscience can have a testimony. That's what he's doing right here. I can testify with my conscience, because I'm not going to lie about it. I'm not going to belittle it and make sure to make it out to be like it's nothing. Um, these people did great by us. They gave us food. They gave us clothing. They gave us lodging everywhere we went. And when we went to these people specifically. Um, so your conscience can have a testimony. Some people, they can get prideful. Um, they can ask for too much. That's why another testimony of the conscience. Uh, they can ask... I could ask for too much. Like I said, God has provided everything I need and more. I have so many blessings in my life. I don't deserve one of them, but I have so many blessings in my life. I'm not going to get on camera and say, now I could use more money, so could you guys send me more money? I believe the testimony also of his conscience is that they only took what they needed. And people were happy to give it. Mm -hmm. That's why I believe you should be donating. Um, when you have an abundance, donate. Help people out. First, brothers and sisters in Christ, then the lost world. Okay. So, your conscience can have a testimony. You know how many people they witness and they say, Well, I did this, and it got me into this trouble. And... This is what the Lord did and how the Lord got me out of it and I have repented and your conscience is having a testimony. I told him it was wrong. I knew it was wrong. It's my fault. And your testimony helps other people from making that same mistake. Someone said that um, you have to learn from your own mistakes. I think that's a half-truth. I believe that there are times where you're going to learn, because of your stubbornness or your pride, you're going to have to learn from your own mistakes. But it's still possible for you to learn from other people's mistakes. They have their testimony of their conscience, hey, I made this mistake, you don't have to. But I remember growing up as a kid, my grandfather got to the point where he's like, I told you so. I told you you shouldn't do that. I told you, you know, he has experience. The elders have experience, and the younger sometimes just don't want to listen to the elders. Hey, I went through that. You don't have to go through that. But sometimes our stubbornness and our pride, we won't listen, and we end up having to learn for ourselves. So you can have a test, your conscience can have a testimony. Chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. This one wraps around, so I need to get to this. Read verses 1 through 4. So we're going to do 2 Corinthians 4. We're going to read 1 through 4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commendeth ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And let's stop there a second. The conscience knows how it talks about all these things, that they aren't doing it. They're not, uh, they're renouncing the hidden things of dishonesty, and every man's conscience is bearing witness. Yes, they are uh, renouncing all the hidden things of dishonesty. Okay. Not walking in craftiness. Yes, they're not walking in craftiness. My conscience bears witness. They're not walking in craftiness. Uh, handing the word of God deceitfully. Okay. 
Verse 3, but if the gospel be hid, because sometimes you're doing everything right, and people aren't going <laughs> to, they, they're not going to understand. Why? Because if the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Okay. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the mind of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is an image of God, should shine unto them. Now this is talking about your conscience bearing witness, but I want to encourage the brethren out there that there are times when you're going to preach the gospel and you're going to be like, you feel like you've failed. Because um, you didn't get through to them. You didn't fail, okay? If the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. You told them about their sin. You told them the consequence of their sin. You told them they need to repent. You, you planted the seed of who Jesus Christ is and what He did for them. You did great. Okay. Your conscience. My conscience can bear record. You tell me a story. I did this, I did this, but man, I feel like I failed. And I, my conscience can bear witness and say, hey, you did what you were supposed to do. They're the ones that failed, not you. They're the ones that couldn't understand the gospel because they are lost. They reject Jesus Christ because they love their sin. They can't understand the position they're in. They're on their way to hell. All right? So your conscience can test, uh, testify of the deeds of somebody else saying, yes, it lines up with the book. Yes, he did good. Yes. They did all these things. Okay? They, were, they, they were not walking in craftiness. And the biggest thing I keep pointing out is nor handling the word of God deceitfully. And lately we've been having to deal with a lot of false teachers that have been doing just that. And some of the teachers don't even, what is it, uh, handling the word of God deceitfully. Some of the teachers are going like this and getting outside sources and bringing them in. So they're not handling the, the word of God deceitful. They're just throwing it to the side. And your conscience should hit you and go, something's not right here. The Bible, if he can't prove it from the Bible, why is he grabbing outside sources? If he could prove it from the Bible, why is he grabbing terms that aren't found in the, found in the Bible? Your conscience can witness to whether somebody else is doing right. right. And it wrapped around, so now... We are going to 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 5. We're going to read 10 and 11. Let me find 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which is one page over. We're going to read 10 and 11. Let me make sure 11. Okay. Number 10. For, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the thing done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. Okay. This goes back to what I was talking about fear. Okay. The, the lost world... They can get to the point where their conscience has become so defiled and will get to the point about evil that they no longer have a fear of God. And the ones that we're going to get saved are the ones that still have a fear, whether it's small, and you build it up by letting them know the terror of the Lord. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Okay. This is also for saved people. When a brother in Christ corrects you, something in your life you're not doing, you're doing that you're not supposed to do. Okay. Um, but we are made manifest unto God. Okay, God sees everything. Um, so your conscience, uh, that they are made, also made manifest in your conscience. Okay, it also has to do with uh, witnessing. Okay, I can see when someone's truly sorry, they also... Um, the reason that you get to that point of repentance and repent something, like I told you before, is you have that fear of God's chastening. The terror of the Lord. Okay? Now, for the lost world, that terror is wrath. For the saved, it's chastening. Okay? The fear needs to be there. And if your conscience says there's nothing to fear, there's something wrong. It's become defiled. 
It's become evil. Okay? And we'll get to that point. There should be fear of God. Your conscience should say, hey, you need to fear God. Okay? Next, we are going to 1 Timothy 1.5. And we are going the good ways. First Timothy chapter one, verse five. Verse five. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Okay? Charity, you're supposed to have charity out of a pure heart. Now, charity, real quick, I want to just uh, uh, read 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now by the faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Okay? Now, pure heart. You're supposed to have charity out of a pure heart. You're not supposed to be like, am I going to get anything out of it? Okay? And of a good conscience. Okay? Once again, I'm supposed to do this because I'm supposed to and because I want to. Okay? And you're not to do it and be fake. That's where it gets to the next part. Of faith unfeigned and of faith unfeigned. Unfeigned means fake. Okay? supposed to be not fake. When you feign your death, I don't know if you've ever heard that before, feigning your death, you're faking your death. You're not really dead, but you're trying to get people to believe you're dead. Uh, unfeigned means you're not faking it. Okay? Your charity is supposed to be pure and of a good conscience. Remember, good conscience, right with God. Your charity needs to be right with the Lord, and it needs to be strong. Okay? Your conscience needs to be strong to let you know, hey, you need to have charity for that person. Okay, you need to have charity for that person. You need to understand that that, that person over there might be newly saved. Okay? That person over there, he might have never heard about Jesus Christ. The real Jesus Christ. Because I've said it before, everybody I've ever talked to, they've heard of a Jesus, but they haven't heard of the Jesus. Okay? You're supposed to have charity with a pure heart and of a good conscience. So good here. Right with the Lord and strong. So, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwrecked. Okay? Holding faith. And a good conscience. Remember we talked about good. Good means right with God and strong. Which some have put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. And yes, I can't help but say it. I did the study on um, could the Trinity be meant to take people's faith out of the mysteries. Away from the, their faith. Have them lose faith in the mysteries. So, when you put faith to the side, when we talked about also in another study about head knowledge puffeth up, so you put faith to the side and it becomes all head knowledge. I gotta know, I gotta know. It's no longer about what God wants me to know, it's about I want to know. And your knowledge can get so puffed up you forget to have faith. And what happens? Shipwrecked. You make a mess of things. 1 Timothy 3, so right there, good. Your conscience can be good again. Another reference to good. 1 Timothy 3, 9. First Timothy 3, 9. Holding, this is where we're getting to it. Holding the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. Okay. We just read that back there about if you don't have faith, if you put away concerning faith, have made shipwrecked, right? you make a mess of things. Um, we wanted to look up the word pure. Sometimes people understand, but 
Sometimes it's good to go back over the words again just to make sure. Definitions 2 and 6. Free from moral defilement, without spot, not sullied or tarnished, incorrupt, in other words, not corrupted, undebased by moral turpitude, holy, not, not vegetated with improper or corrupt words or phrases, corrupt words or phrases with a pure heart, and you got the Trinity people coming in using corrupt words and phrases as a pure style of discourse or composition. Okay. Pure heart. You're supposed to have hold the mystery of faith in a pure conscience. So here we know that your conscience can be pure. Free from moral defilement. Okay. When it comes to having faith in things that you can't see, faith in things that you can't understand. Someone attacks this book and says, I believe this is a mistake. And you're like, I really can't answer it or explain it. You don't give up on the book. Just because you don't know something doesn't mean you give up faith. Just because you don't know something doesn't mean you come up with your own definition in your own terms. Okay? Your conscience can be pure. Okay? When you become moral defiled, that means you're telling yourself it's okay. It's okay. There's nothing wrong. It's okay. As a Christian, we can have a pure conscience. Our conscience says, you know what? I'm just going to have faith. Simple faith. I don't understand it, and I'm not going to try to screw up that faith by trying to wiggle around and do use my own head to try to figure it out instead of waiting for my heart, the Holy Spirit, to explain it to me. Or if I'm not supposed to know it, like the mysteries, uh, faith in the mysteries. You can have a pure conscience. Okay? So we see here your conscience can be pure. You know, 